the newly released ASRS reporting disclosures. My name is Tom Latimer, and I'm one of the directors here at Social Suite. Uh, before we dive into the session, just run through a bit of housekeeping. Everyone can see the uh, chat box on the right hand side. If you've got any questions you're going along, feel free to, to pop those in there. Uh, we will leave 10 minutes towards the end for a Q&A to address uh, any questions raised as well. Uh, and there'll also be a couple of polls throughout the webinar as well, so keep an eye out for those. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with Social Suite, we're a sustainability and technology advisory organization um, that's got a specific focus around helping organizations streamline their materiality process. Um, the aim of today's webinar, obviously, is to provide some clarity around the ASRS disclosure requirements. We speak to a lot of companies. A lot of very focused on thinking it is just around GHG emissions, um, but it's actually a lot broader than that. So to help us um, sort of guide through this topic, we are joined by our Chief Impact Officer, Dr. Tim Siegenby van Hoekelom, uh, and also kind of joined by Ilona Marchetta from Ilona Marchetta Consulting, um, who is helping a lot of organizations through this process. Um, before I hand across to, to Tim and Lerner, I might just pop up the, the first poll um, just to help shape the conversation. It'd be good just to understand um, of the audience that, that's tuned in now, where are you at on your ASRS compliance journey, whether you're just starting, you've no formalized plans as of yet, whether you're sort of in the early stages and you're in progress and sort of currently developing or uh, building out that roadmap. You could also be well underway and, and deep into uh, implementing those measures to disclose or you could be fully compliant um, and confidently reporting. And yeah, we should probably have you on the panel. So I think there's a few uh, majority there, Tim alone. It looks like um, no formal plans are the early stages. So hopefully we can provide some pretty good practical steps in terms of what companies have to do and, and how they can go about it. So yeah, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks Tom, for the introduction. Um, welcome everyone. Pleasure to have everyone here today. And we'll all be talking about preparing for the Australian Sustainability Reporting Standards. So we're really kind of, it's good to see legislation has passed. We have two standards now. So I think all the components that people were waiting for are in place now. So this is a really good time to um, further unpack today, what are the ASRS? So what's really in there and looking at the key requirements. So we now in the end have two standards. We have AASBS1 and AASBS2. So what are the key requirements of those standards? What do they focus on? And then that is, I think, the key really for today as well is what are some practical actions you can take right now to prepare for that reporting? And we do see in the poll, a lot of people are trying to figure that out. What can I do now to prepare, to get ready? Um, and that's where our focus will be on today. So first of all, let's, let's look at the Australian Sustainability Reporting Sense. Where do they come from? What are they really? Um, is it something brand new? Have we all just kind of, you know, started that from scratch here in Australia, or is it something that's based on something that's out there? And that's, of course, the answer as well, that what we have done here in Australia with these standards is it's based on the existing IFRS sustainability disclosure standards. Some people might know them as the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board standards, but commonly they're now known as the IFRS SDS or Sustainability Disclosure Standards, and they exist off, as you see here, of IFRS S1 on general requirements for disclosure of sustainability related financial information and IFRS S2 climate related disclosures. And if we then jump to the left of the slide, we see that the Australian Sustainability Reporting Standards really closely align with that. So they are based on those standards and they're also aligned to that. So we see there's, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, it's really kind of taking that international standard and really made sure that there's been minor changes in the end. Um, so the standards that we have, if you report on those, you're pretty much very closely reporting on those global standards. And Australia is not alone. There are a lot of other jurisdictions now around the world implementing these standards. Some of them pass them through almost directly. They just keep calling them IFRS S1, S2 without any changes. And some jurisdiction makes some minor changes to that. And the key change that we have here in Australia compared to some other jurisdictions is that we have those two standards. And what we see there is the first standard on the general requirements for disclosure of sustainability related financial information. So think about that. So, you know, a mouthful, it's just look at the sustainability realm, think about all those ESG topics on environment, social and governance, 
What are the key components there that you need to disclose on? That's implemented here in the state as a voluntary standard, so you don't have to do that from a mandated uh, legislative perspective, but it is really a starting point for a lot of companies to start thinking about sustainability. But what is mandated here is really a specific focus, and that is on climate. So the climate-related disclosures in AASBS2, they are mandated. So that is really what you have to do. And we'll be looking at both standards today. So with that, um, and maybe here, I think what we've tried to do is kind of get a little bit more to that detail. What is in a SBS1 versus S2? And the key difference there, again, is that one is about all sustainability topics and determining what is material you should be reporting on. And in S2, it's really focused on climate. That is what we focus on. And there's a lot of kind of components on that that they'll be looking at. And both come together um, in, in ultimately in your reporting process. Now with that, um, Alona, like this is something that a lot of companies struggle with, is trying to figure out, you know, although the, you know, the clear tables and rules, but a lot of people are still kind of asking questions like, when should I be reporting? What, what is your take on this in terms of um, where might companies struggle looking at this table? And what are the key questions that you might have heard from companies that say, well, it's still not entirely clear where I fall in or what group or when I should start reporting? Um, any, any tips or insights on, on this kind of you know, table in terms of where, where companies belong? I think the table itself is pretty clear. I think where companies are getting stuck is in thinking that this maybe doesn't apply to them because they're not in a high emitting sector. And I think that's I think that's where a lot of companies are falling over is in still looking at this and wondering, but does it apply to my industry? Does it apply to my sector? That's actually where I'm getting the most questions. So the important thing to keep in mind when you look at this table is that it applies to you if you're, uh, I mean, the key thing there is required to lodge financial reports. And then we've got the thresholds, the other two thresholds there. So it's um, lodging the financial reports under Chapter 2M, which is our uh, listed companies and our large proprietary companies. Um, if, you, if you fall in one of those buckets, uh, and, and also not-for-profit as well, um, here is, your, here is uh, when you will be required to report. I think that's a good point. We, we've had that question a lot. Well, what about not-for-profits? Yes, they fall under this. Um, and I think the key thing here is people look at the groups and I like, get yeah, that's all clear, but it doesn't apply to me. It, it's very likely applying to you. So really look at the top there around to the groups, the entities required to lodge financial reports. If you're required to do that, then you look at the groups and then you look at if you take two of those three criteria there. And it's so it's for a lot of companies very likely that you'll be affected by this. Um, now, what does it mean if you look at this and you, do, you fall outside of group three, does that mean you're kind of, you know, shop free, don't have to worry about anything? And we know the answer to that is no, because of the way the reporting standards and the way carbon emissions accounting works, we mandated companies have to consider their value chain. So if you fall within the value chain of a company that does sit in one of these three groups, it is very likely that those companies, and they could be your investors as well, will come asking you for your data, so your emissions data, and also uh, your own risk and opportunity assessment because they need to be considering your risks and opportunities as part of their own reporting. So that's why it's really important to consider not just whether you fall within one of these three groups, but what's happening in your network, your business relationships, do any of those uh, players fall within these three groups? And it is more than likely that if you are a company on this webinar right now, that the answer will be yes, you'll fall in one of these three buckets or you will have a business relationship with an entity that does. And I think that is the key there. If you're not falling in the three groups, you're falling in this, you know, catch all group where it's very likely that someone in your network or business relationship will come knocking on the door when the time is you know, right for them to report. And they'll ask you, can I have your GHG emissions? Because that's my scope three. And what are your climate related risks and opportunities? Because you sit in my value chain. If you're not prepared for that, you either really quickly need to get onto it at that point, or if your answer no, that might have business implications. So it's really important to keep that in mind. So. The short answer it is, it will affect a lot of companies. If not all, 
majority of companies will in one or another way be affected by the legislation. Now, another key question that we often get is then how do we actually report on this? So it will look at a bit more detail around the, the requirements in S1 and S2 and what are the components in there, but where do you report this information? And there's been some confusion there. So one of the key things that if you do read through these standards, it does say that, yeah, it needs to be disclosed in the general purpose financial report. But there are some other kind of, you know, additions to that alone. Can you touch upon that? Uh, yes. So it will be in your financial report um, and you can either include the information in your financial report or you might reference where you have provided the information in your financial report. So if you'd like to produce a standalone report, you can. It's just important that those two reports come out at the same time and that they uh, that they, they they clearly reference each other and you clearly reference where, if you're providing a link, the important information is held. So you can't just provide a link to, let's say, back to your website. It needs to be um, very clear, very direct where the actual information is being held. So if it's elsewhere, if it's not in your financial statement, but it's in, in your financial statement is part of your annual report and it sits elsewhere in the report, just state the section or the paragraphs where that information is covered. And equally, if you do a separate sustainability report, make sure that that separate sustainability report is reporting on the same entity, so the same operational boundaries, the same reporting period, and the report is provided at the same time as your financial statements. And there's a clear link to that report and where in that report. So if that is 100 pages, be really clear where in that report is that information contained. Now, the simplest version, of course, is to just follow the standard and just put it in a general purpose financial statements but if for some reason you can't that is allowed but really be very mindful of that you really clearly cross-reference that and do it for the same reporting time entity um, and, and make sure that all it all links up and checks out so with that let's let's dive in a little bit deeper than into s1 and s2 so what are those key requirements in there a lot of people are, you know still wondering what is it but the first, I think, starting point is, is quite important. When we go back to what we looked at at the start, these standards have been developed internationally by the International Sustainability Standards Board. And what they've done is they've used the existing task force on climate-related financial disclosures, TCFD, their pillars. They have four pillars on governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and targets. So it's the framework, like the foundation of building those two standards. That being said, S2 actually, AASB S2 and IFRS S2 are effectively what TCFD used to do. It's almost a carbon copy of what TCFD required in terms of their climate related financial disclosures. It's now called S2. So one of the things that we find is if companies have already been TCFD reporting, you might already have done a lot of that work that's required on the S2. So there's a clear link with TCFD there um, and not everyone is aware of that. So that's, I think, one of the key things. Is there any further implications or key things to realize around this, Alona? The only thing I'll probably add to this is from having done a fair bit of analysis on companies, uh, gap analysis, who have been doing TCFD reporting, reporting and they're wondering how prepared they are for, uh, for S2. What I'm noticing in terms of the gap is um, probably around the, the financials. Um, and so AASB uh, S2, really asks for a lot more information on financial performance, financial analysis. And that's what I'm noticing is the biggest gap for people who have been doing TCFD reporting. With TCFD, a lot of it has been allowed to be um, more quantitative, uh, qualitative information, whereas we're really moving to quantitative financial information. And I think that touches upon a little bit. I see a question in the chat from Sydney there about what are the extra things that S2 requires as opposed to TCFD. I think you've touched upon that. That's a key thing to keep in mind that TCFD gives you a very solid base, but there's still work to be done. And we see a lot of companies, the first step they take is do a gap analysis. What have I done in my latest TCFD report? How does that transpose onto S2? And what are the key gaps where I just need to collect more information or implement different initiatives or write better disclosures that more focused on quantitative uh, financial you know components rather than qualitative so there's definitely some some changes there 
if we're looking then at um, material information, what 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 is you know in terms of materiality, what does ASRs really require there? Yeah, this is really important for us to take a look at, um, particularly for companies who are potentially maybe up to now you've been including a sustainability or an ESG section in your financial reports, but you haven't really been doing them based off any frameworks. And this concept of ESG materiality is really new for you. Um, I think this is this is where uh, companies who are really new to re sustainability reporting are really going to find that challenge in wrapping their heads around materiality. So for ASRS, we're looking at financial materiality. Um, for people who, who are more familiar with sustainability reporting, you know, we've got, we've got impact materiality and financial materiality. We're looking at financial materiality with ASRS. And it's really important that we do have a bit more of a deeper look at what we're looking at. What, what, what are we really being asked to provide here? So the first point there, we're providing information to help the user. And in this case, the, the primary user is uh, investors, lenders, and other creditors. So people who provide you with money. Uh, we're really looking at providing the user with information to help them make decisions about providing you with that, with that funding. And onto the second point, we want information about risks and opportunities that could affect your prospects. So Again, big emphasis on your financial performance, your financial position. And on to, the, on to the next point, materiality is really, there's a key point there, entity specific. So for companies who have been used to potentially basing their fo the focus of their sustainability reports on potentially just what their competitors have been doing or just what has been recommended for their industry, we're going much deeper and we're expected to be entity specific. And we've got some other important words there highlighted, relevance based on the nature or magnitude or both uh, of the information that we're talking about here. So these give us some clues as to how we need to start thinking about materiality and measuring materiality. Um, On to the second last point there. Again, the information is material if it could influence decisions of people who are going to give you money. And on to the final point, we're assuming that those primary users are expecting a return and that's why they're consuming this information. So it really helps us think about what information could be material to be including in these reports. And I, th I think this is a really important component because we do see, to your point, a lot of companies that have traditionally been reporting on ESG or impact or sustainability, but very much in a let's say, you know, quotation marks, marketing exercise where it's a nice looking with a lot of photo sustainability report. There might be a lot of information in there about your corporate sustainability initiatives and programs that you have. Um, there might be a lot of information about topics that you believe are important for the, for the business, but it has not directly kind of looked at what are the key kind of components around sustainability information or climate related data that investors need to make decisions and leaving that information out influences potentially their decision making. So it's really an important process there to make sure that you're not overwhelming on the one hand investors with a lot of your photos of all the great work you're doing and that, you know, they have to go to reams of information to find what they're looking for or equally that they can't find what they're looking for because you have not assessed that as relevant to your investors. So I think where we're moving with this is we're moving from glossy sustainability reports with a lot of narrative to more quantitative data-based exercises in which you actually go to less disclosures, but they're really robust, they're deep, they're across your value chain, they're standardized, and investors can really kind of consume that information in a very targeted and focused way to understand what your risks and opportunities are, because that is what it's all about. So there's, a, there's for some companies that have been doing that for a long time already, but other companies that might have you know, taken a different approach, this might be a, a very different way of thinking about it. But if you think about it, essentially what we're doing here is we're kind of using the same principles in financial reporting, we're just using it now for non-financial reporting on information that still has a financial impact on your entity's prospects and financial position. So if we then, then look at S2 in a bit more detail, because that is the mandatory standard there. That's what we see where everyone, what everyone has to do, climate-related disclosures. Can you take us through that, Ilona? 
Yeah, and this is really for as as long as the uh, the standards are. There are actually 86 uh, line items in S2. If you if you don't um, look at the application guidance, if you do look at the application guidance, well, we're well into the hundreds. So what we've managed to do here is distill those 86 line items down into like six key points that. S2 is really asking of you, and remember S2 is our climate-related disclosures. So we want a description of each risk or opportunity, including the time horizon, and we want to know if it's a physical or a transition risk. And we want to know where in the business model and the value chain those risks and opportunities are con concentrated, and we want to know their current and anticipated effects on the business model and the value chain. And then we're really moving now into the financial bits. So we want to know the current financial effects of those risks and opportunities on your financial performance and financial position. And then we want to know how you plan to respond to those risks and opportunities through your strategy and decision making. And then once you've done that thinking, we want to know how you expect your financial position and your financial performance to change over the short, medium and long term and how resilient are you? So that is, in a nutshell, what S2 is asking you to disclose across 86 line items. And there's a great graphic there pulled from the, uh, the, the TCFD, which kind, of, which kind of lays it out there um, in a nice structured way uh, of what we're really dealing with here. I think any, this, any any thoughts on that team? Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is quite useful to look as well. When people often think like physical transition risks, the clear categories there that TCFD has already provided you to start thinking through those categories. So on physical risks, think about acute and chronic risks. On transition risks, think through policy and legal, technology, market, reputation. So it already gives you some guidance what direction to think in. So but it's really important to go through that exercise equally. Don't forget the opportunities because we see often people quite kind of, you know, quickly sell climate risks, but don't forget the opportunity component. That's really important as well. There's a downside, there's an upside, and there might be more risks and opportunities, but that's not always the case. So it's really important to really assess that and don't forget that. And the other component then, I think that you touched upon, Alana, it's really important that it's not a matter of just identifying those risks and opportunities. There's a lot more that needs to happen after that. And I think that's what people sometimes kind of go wrong in that sense, like, oh, we've identified risks and opportunity. Here's a list, and that's the end of it. No, that's the beginning of it. Now there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of thinking, how do those risks, what are the financial effects, how are we going to address that, what is our strategy in, from, in terms of governance, how are we going to provide ongoing governance to make sure there are no new risks and opportunities that arise, how do we capture that, how are we going to provide a you know, oversight from a board level, what is management going to do? What is the, you know, on the ground, how is that going to feed in? So there's a lot there to think about and to do rather than just to, you know, write a report. There's a lot of this that translates into almost like you need to embed this really in your business. It needs to become business as usual. It can't be a, you know, end of the year, quick reporting exercise because you're going to really kind of hit some, some roadblocks. Then you'll figure out that there's a lot of things you need to do that you don't have time for or that you just did not anticipate. So it's a process that needs to be implemented in your business that will be ongoing. With that, Dan, how do you fulfill the requirements of S2? So what are you really expected to do? And I think this is taking some of the, the requirements and making it a bit more practical there. What are some of those exercises? Because reporting always comes at the end. You report on your performance. But to have performance, you need to do things. If you haven't done anything, then you might report my performance. There's no performance because you haven't done anything. So this is really getting to the, you know, what do you need to do to be able to report? So this is really about preparing for ASS reporting, particularly on S2. Again, can you take us through that? What are some of the key exercises and components that companies will better start thinking about and doing about rather soon? Yeah, so... So starting with your value chain, mapping your value chain, this is really a foundational activity. You need to work out uh, not just not just what's happening in our in our uh, four walls, so to speak, but uh, our entire end to end uh, from our raw materials, so to speak, right through to end consumption of whatever it is that our business does or produce. 
Uh, and we need to be thinking about what are the activities that are happening in each component of our value chain? What industries did those activities fall in? Uh, what raw materials do, does each component of our value chain rely on? And we also need to be thinking about who are the, what are the key relationships that we have in each of those components? And where are each of these components located? Because that might bring with it in itself uh, different sustainability risks and opportunities that need to be considered. Um, you can think about um, how uh, sustainability is rolling out globally and all the differences in the policies, for example, uh, and differences in geography. So that's step, uh, step number one. And then once you've done that, you need to move into that climate risk and opportunity assessment and you need to use relevant scenarios. So scenario analysis uh, sounds really scary and big and overwhelming, um, but uh, it is actually still in its infancy and companies are only expected to start very iteratively. And once you have mapped your value chain, it becomes fairly obvious what sort of scenarios you need to be using. So that risk and opportunity assessment needs to consider, again, not just our own business, but our entire value chain. And then when we're thinking about physical risks, we're thinking about the degree of exposure and vulnerability that we have to extreme weather events. We're thinking about actual facilities and actual locations. When we think about transition risks, this is where all this carbon accounting that everyone is doing comes into play. So we're thinking about what is our reliance on carbon at the moment? How is that going to impact us as the world is moving to a net zero economy? So uh, these are the things that we're thinking about when we're doing that um, risk and opportunity assessment. And from the graphic that we looked at earlier, we could see that we've actually got very clear categories that we need to be looking at in terms of those risks and opportunities. You're not just thrown in the deep end with this very vague term. So there's help there. Once we've done that, we need to identify, uh, embed um, a, a formula for ongoing identification and management of those risks and opportunities. So this isn't something we're just going to do once and then forget about for 10 years. We need to think about how do we operationalise the ongoing assessment and management of those risks and opportunities. We need to we need to think about if something changes in our value chain, how are we going to be aware of that and start to think about how is that changing our risks and opportunities? And we need to think about how we embed that into our governance and our risk management framework. So ideally, you'd be using your existing risk management framework. That would be best practice. Uh, and very, very importantly, we need to be building that internal capacity. What is the role of uh, the board, for example, uh, in, uh, in, in comparison to our management team in, in managing our climate related risks and opportunities? Um, these are all the things that S2 is going to ask of you. So it's always good to just give an example. And I was, there was one that I just saw recently so if you think about the physical risks there, so this sounds very theoretical, like how do how do we do this? And this is a real thing, does it affect companies? So in July, Porsche, the car manufacturer, issued a profit warning because they were critically affected by flooding in Germany that stopped their total supply of al aluminium. So they had a big problem there. So that is a physical risk that is exposure to no extreme weather events there in your supply chain. There's a critical business dependency there. So you, and that affects Porsche's profit. So there was a profit warning there. So you see all these things suddenly, just news articles you read and you start identifying that, hey, um, you're almost like if you read the news, you can do a climate risk and opportunity assessment. You see these things like, hey, that is a critical dependency. That's a supply chain risk. So once you get a hang of this, it becomes a lot clearer, but it does help at times to think about if you can't make it up for your own business, think about what do you see in the news? Are there some key examples you can pick up and then start applying that thinking to your own business? Yeah. So with that, there's a bit more practical application then, which is always good. Um, so some practical actions to really start preparing for ASOS reporting. Um, and I think this, is, this, this first point really goes back to the start of the webinar where we're, we're talking about like, who does it apply? And I think, that's really important here to really start thinking about it, that engage early within your business, really educate your team and leadership about, you know, this is probably going to impact all companies or the majority of companies. 
not only those companies in group one, two, and three, other companies will be impacted indirectly as well by this. So where do we fall in that? And what does our full value chain look like? So I think to that point, that early engagement with your business partners, your investors, and your business relationship across that value chain is really important just to see what might they require from you at what point in time and start getting a sense of that in terms of really understanding for your business. If you're in group three, you might be like, oh, that's a few years away. But maybe you have a lot of group one reporters in your value chain that need your data next year. So it's that type of thinking is really important. Even if you know your timeline to report or you fall outside of that, start working your way through that exercise now. Um, on carbon ac accounting, why, why should companies start early with that or start at all if they're not mandated uh, by legislation? What are your thoughts on that, Alona? Uh, again, depending on uh, what's going on in your value chain, if you have scope one and two emissions, then you will be contributing to the scope three emissions of your value chain around you. It is highly likely that someone's going to ask you for that data very soon, depending on uh, where they are in the three groups that we just looked at. So um, really important, regardless of whether you're mandated to report, that you be thinking about how you're going to be accounting for your scope one and two emissions. And there's, um, as we know, some great uh, software providers out there now making carbon accounting much easier than it has been historically. Um, so that's really important. And we were talking a little bit as well around um, companies who only have scope three emissions, uh, because this this question comes up a lot. You know, I we don't uh, we don't own any company cars. We lease all our buildings. Our employees all work from home. Uh, you know, how relevant or important is this for us? Now, um, there's a big focus on scope three emissions at the moment. Um, for those people, if you are mandated to report you would still be starting to do carbon accounting. You would be doing that now very soon. Um, as for those who are not mandated to report and you only have scope three, case by case, again, it's important, engage your business partners and your investors to understand what information they're going to want from you. Where is the bulk of those scope three emissions lying uh, in your value chain? You know, these are the sorts of questions and things that you should be thinking about. So I think the short of it is really start thinking about that, you know, engage early about the requirements, but also really start thinking about carbon accounting across scope one and two and three, what, what's required, not only from a legislative point of view, but also from your business relationship and in your value chain, what might you be asked for? Um, and really look at your business, not just at your industry, really look at entity specific, what is relevant to you? And that's that's quite an important message. Um, third one then is complete a materiality assessment. So we see that there's a really kind of what we spoke about. It's really important that we start looking at the quality of information provided and that it's really relevant, significant, or in other words, material information that you know the users or that make decisions about your resource and funding can actually use. So it's really important to start doing that for in S1. And then in S2, there's really that it's about those client-related climate. Uh, um, climate related financial risks and opportunities and you come up with all of them but again you're going to assess the financial impact and work out which ones are really material there so materiality is really a concept that is you know embedded into a lot of this reporting what are your what are your okay. thoughts Alana? yeah i really want to um i really want to reiterate what you've said there tim because it, it can't be said enough for for all companies who have been including a sustainability section in their annual reports and ESG section, but they've never looked at a framework, referred to a framework or built it on, on a framework, this is probably going to be the biggest change for you. Um, investors are, are really having a heightened focus on materiality. So we're kind of really moving away from that world where you can just kind of talk about things and topics that seem easy or might kind of seem important for you. We're really moving into this world where a best practice materiality assessment is just is just baseline standard for anyone who wants to talk about ESG or sustainability. Yeah, I think that's yeah, it's it's becoming if not mandated, it's becoming best practice, the, the gold standards for sustainability reporting at large. The fourth point then here 
is I think a really important one as well is aligning your sustainability strategy with your business strategy. So I think the takeaway here is that sustainability should not be treated as this, uh, it's a, you know, we have an ESG person, a sustainability person, anything related to sustainability, we'll throw it at their desk, they'll deal with it, it doesn't affect the rest of the business. Think about financial reporting. It, that doesn't work that way. Every department's got their own budget, their budget lines. They need to look at that throughout the year. So financial reporting and finan just dealing with the, the finances in your business is embedded throughout departments. Everyone has a role in that to some degree. Treat sustainability the same way. It is just non-financial non information about risks and opportunities to your business that are related to sustainability matters. So it's really important to look at it that way. And that also means for a strategic point of view, make sure that your business strategy incorporates sustainability as one of the key pillars or components there. Don't have a separate strategy around sustainability that is like, you know, sitting on the fringes there, we'll do some good things. Make sure that that sustainability strategy is embedded in your business strategy and informed again by materiality. Really focus on what is important to your business. What should you be working on from, a, you know, get, making your business more, um, sustainable in the long run, because that really is more of a strategic value approach rather than just a compliance tick box. So that's a really important one. And I think the last one there, um, what we've done early in the year, um, Alon and I have created a ASRS readiness assessment. So we've taken the standards and said, as a company, you want to understand how prepared you are. So we've gone through all those components, all the requirements there, and really kind of created a, a survey effectively that you can fill out in 10 minutes and which you can go through to understand what do you already have and what is your capacity to do that reporting. So it's quite an um, quite an, an, a useful exercise. We found a lot of companies in Australia that have already done this. Um, I think from May onwards, but we see now with the final standards launched, with the legislation passed, um, we see the link is actually in the chat here, so um, you can follow that link to, to get to our readiness assessment. And it's worthwhile to do that. And what you get out of that um, assessment is a report, and we can walk, that, walk through that report with you. If you go to our website, you can also find the webinar that Alona and I did that launches, and that really goes into a bit more detail what's in that readiness assessment. So if you do want to look at that, you can find that online as well. And this is uh, the three pages of a generally a six, seven page report that you get um, out of the readiness assessment. And it really gives you by different sections based on what your information provided, how well prepared you are. And that enables us again then to help you identify where do you fall in that journey? Are you early in the journey, just starting? Are you kind of preparing information? Are you kind of almost ready to report, but there might still be some things that you need to do to really kind of lock everything in. So a really good exercise. Recommend you have a look at that. Um, if you're not sure yet where you are, this is a good way to just get a bit more information. It's free. It only takes 10 minutes. So it's a good starting point for most companies. With that, um, and I, I saw a, a question come up from Lena as well, but hey, carbon accounting, doesn't that relate to S1, which is voluntary? And I think on this slide, we really clearly see that carbon sits on the S2. And it's a really important component that carbon accounting that you do quite a few things there, but it's not the only thing. And sometimes we do get people that think, oh, we already know our carbon footprint, so we're good. That's the mandated standard S2. That's climate, so that's carbon, so we're good. Now, there's a lot more, and Alona has really kind of outlined it today. What are all those things you need to do from value chain to that climate risk assessment to, you no know, translating that into what are the financial numbers based on scenario analysis, so there's a whole lot of things there. And yes, you also need to report on your, your carbon footprint there. So that's important as well, but it's not the only thing. So carbon is a component, a key component of that S2 standard, which is mandatory. And as Alon already flagged earlier, um, there's some good platforms out there. And we have friends at Sunday that do a tremendous job at making carbon accounting a lot easier with that platform. Um, so all together, we're there to help you prepare for the ASRS. And we're really kind of looking forward to a lot of people in the webinar today to have that chat with you around, you know, what do you need to get started? So maybe start off with doing that readiness assessment, because that gives us a lot of information that otherwise we'll have to ask in a, if we speak to you. It really gets us ready for a, for a chat with you to see where you are. 
Now with that, um, we're close to time. So I think I'm going to ask Tom back to the stage and see if there are any further questions that have come up that we uh, that we can address. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Alana. Um, yeah, as, as Tim mentioned, if anyone's got any further questions, then feel free to, to pop them in the chat. Um, just as people are, are popping the questions in the chat, I might just bring up another another poll just to see, um, you know, where are organizations focus areas in terms of are you looking at this thinking, yep, you know, we need to do this from a general sustainability perspective and focus on S1. Are you looking at this from what you need to do, a mandated S2 component? Or are you thinking this from a lot broader holistic perspective and you're looking at sort of complying with both? Um, so I think quite a quite a split across the board, really. Um, in terms of the questions, we've got a couple in the chat. So Sydney posted one earlier. Um, what are the extra things that you require as opposed to PTFD? Um, Tim or Lana, I don't know which one wants to, to take that one. Yeah. We, we've covered the first two questions from Sydney and Lena. Um, I think the question from Tim, is it assumed that reported metrics on the S2 are required at all levels in a business hierarchy? I think that's a really good question there. Um, Alona, like from my understanding, it is, yeah, it, it is across your entire business and across your value chain. So you really need to, it's not just a, a high or low level exercise. It is really, and that's why what we find it's, it's, it's really important to take this quite serious in that sense that you can't get away with an off the cuff back of the napkin, like, oh, well, you know, we have some, <laughs> some risk. Yeah. it is a, it's a full on exercise. So, um, yeah, do you have any further thoughts on that question? Just the, the, only just for, for people who are absorbing that for the very first time, that can feel extremely overwhelming. Um, you know, there are you are expected to have considered exactly that up, down, and across. Um, if you if you can't get the exact data, you can make assumptions. You can get industry averages, but you need to disclose that and be transparent about it. And there needs to be you know some kind of effort to be getting direct data and information where you can. Again, with the idea being, um, uh, you know, at, at reasonable, I can't remember the exact words, but at, at reasonable cost. So, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So Lena's sent a follow up to that. Is scope three prominent in the S1? I think that, um, like, I would qualify that always. Like, I always think that scope, but when you use the word scope, people always think of carbon. So scope three is generally, you know, your, your third scope under the greenhouse gas protocol. So if we talk about S1, S1 is not so much about carbon emissions and climate, it's more general sustainability standard. So we think about S1, but translate that concept scope three, which really means kind of across your value chain. I would say it's an S1, yes, you need to look across that full value chain there. So it's not just about your business, but across the full value chain, where do you have material sustainability related risks and opportunities. So yes, so I would qualify that a little bit. Perfect, thanks Tim. Um, any other questions from anyone else? Um, this is just wedding. I'll state that we will send out the materials post this webinar along with the recording and also a link to the ASRS readiness assessment. As Tim mentioned, it's a really good sort of resource and tool just to help you understand internally uh, areas that you might need to work in and progress and can sort of help with internal discussions um, with the exec team and, and board, et cetera, as well. So yeah, highly recommend to complete that. Um, if there's no other questions, if anyone sort of posts this webinar, feels like they need any additional assistance or any other questions, then feel free to, uh, oh, I think we've got a, a late one that's just come in from Tim again. So how do certain metrics get treated from a context perspective, e.g. absolute burst intensity figures? you've got to disclose whether it is an absolute or an intensity figure that is my recollection so uh that will depend on what the company's net zero strategy is their transition plan and how they're doing carbon accounting so that's a, that's one's case by case but you've just got to disclose how you've done it i hope that answers the question that was a great pop quiz that one <laughs> Yeah, good, good. And finally, um, I would say um, if you want more information as well, um, on our website, you can subscribe to our mailing list and then you'll 
we'll, we'll keep you up to date with any changes, any updates on the requirements, but also other sustainability related webinars and information. So uh, head to our website. You can also find all the webinars that we've done. We do quite a few of them. So there's, there's a lot of resources and information there available for everyone. Perfect. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, I think we're just about at time as well. So thank you for everyone's time and Ilona for, for joining the webinar. Hopefully everyone's got some value and enjoys the rest of the day. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.